I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to Campfire Talk. This is where we sit around the fire with our feet up, have a cold drink, and let the conversation flow. Tom, would you like to make an announcement before we get started? Absolutely. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Today's campfire is going to be pretty interesting. Uh, we're going to, Will, we're going to talk about one of your family members, members, if it's okay to uh, say that. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to say is always, always, always uh, let us know if you like the show. Uh, you can click on the like. and this, If you're on YouTube, like and subscribe and the share button. And then if you want to take it to the next level and become a strategic partner that helps us to help you guys, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Creek Devil. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, just go in the description. Uh, that's It's probably the very first um, link in there. You click the link, follow your nose, and it'll do the rest for you. So with that said, let's talk about this. Okay. Um, well... We'll start off with um, talking. We, we'd been talking a little bit before we started this about uh, an email or a text, I should say, a text I got from my brother-in-law uh, just this morning. And apparently uh, one of his sons, my nephew and his wife, they live up towards Mount Rainier and uh, bought some acreage up there. And it's if anybody knows Eatonville area, it's pretty heavily wooded. And there's a history of these creatures in that area, big history. In fact, we had Ben on the show for two episodes here recently, and Ben's been working in an area that we used to camp in a lot when I was still living up there uh, near Ashford. Well, Ashford isn't that far from Eatonville. So what my, my nephew and his wife recorded um, sounded very much like what we heard in Yakult back in 89 and 90, where the creatures had come start heading down you know, into the, the valley at night screaming and and all the dogs and coyotes of the near shot would just go crazy and it's eerily similar to what we heard back then it sounds just like that there's a strange howling and i'm not going to post it just yet um i gotta wait you know of course to get permission from my nephew and and my brother-in-law is going to ask some more questions but um let me see let me look real quick here okay i asked him how close that the, this howling was to their house and uh my brother-in-law said he thought he thinks it was really close to the house. Uh, my nephew's wife said that um, something was in the backyard just in the tree line this summer. Her description was kind of eerie. They thought bear, but I had my doubts, so I'll have to ask again. So he's going to press uh, them on that, you know. So we'll we'll do an update later on on what's going on there. But it's it's crazy. I mean, you guys you guys have heard the sound. I did, and it's. We've heard it before, and I got to tell you, there was a couple that it was on YouTube a long time ago. I don't know if it's still there or not, but they got uh, they had a breakdown with their boat trailer and truck up around in the uh, northern California Sierras. So they're sitting there. It's nighttime. This is back in 2012, and off in the woods, they heard the identical series of screams pretty soon dogs are going crazy but what was really interesting was their dog was terrified and you know they were the, and the guy even at one point you know, he's trying to make light of the situation his wife's not happy uh you know you can't go anywhere you're a captive audience if these things want to come and get you <laughs> right and uh he mentioned bigfoot Oh, these are just Bigfoot. Have, they, have we ever heard of Bigfoot eating anybody? Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. You know, what got really got my attention, though, was the fact that, well, my brother-in-law, you know, he, he knows what I do because we're, we're pretty close friends, have been for many years. And uh, But my the rest of my family, you know, they're not into the whole Bigfoot thing at all. You know, they'll 
when I visit, it's sort of like, oh, that's very interesting. Wink, wink. You know, <laughs> that's kind of, kind of the attitude we have. You know, nobody's going to give me any guff, but, you know, they're just not into that. Uh, but when something is that out of the normal, you know, they obviously they recorded it. Now, they live in an area and, and where we all grew up. There was lots of coyotes, lots of animals around, you know, so everybody's familiar with the normal sounds. They wouldn't have recorded that if it wasn't so out side you know the realm of normal stuff so um just very interesting you know i mean um, i tell people you know yeah you can think the things aren't out there until you run into one or something like this happens you know well, and that's... the funny thing is it's you know we're out there in the woods and we we know about this stuff pretty pretty well and it's it's your relatives that are the ones that are going to give you a lot of grief and it's really cool that that you know your your relatives have actually caught something and and uh it kind of makes everything legit as to what we do yeah it is it's interesting you know what caught what? my attention will was oh, sorry sorry for us <laughs> i was just kind of kind of kind of concur with with Chuck because I said it was like you know my daughter has uh, always believed in in Bigfoot but uh, it, it's one of those things that you know it's one thing to say that oh yeah I believe in it and I, I told you she actually kind of missed seeing uh, you know the one in Idaho because I really planted her on the floor there you know on the truck but um, <laughs> it uh, uh, she just kind of saw something go into the woods, like, okay, mom. And uh, so she, I mean, she believes me and all that sort of stuff. But then when she saw the footprints out on her property, it was kind of like, oh, it was it, it was one of those oh poop moments. That, uh, you know, uh, it brings you, it you home. Know what? Yeah. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, I can defend mama when everybody else says, oh, your mama, she's crazy, yada, 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 you know. And um, so... Anyway, I, now I she can say, "Oh like no, I, I saw the tracks." Yeah, <laughs> she can say, "Well, if mom's <laughs> crazy, I am too." So, because <laughs> you know, we got the physical proof. You know, my oh. my brother in law. You know, he was a high school social studies teacher for thirty five years, and uh, when he was still working, we were camping up by Ashford, and you know, we're sitting around the fire just chewing the fat. Me and my buddies have known since we were kids, and uh, he says, "Well, you know," uh, he says, "One of my students." And her family was camping just uh, like a mile from here, you know, a few weeks back. And this was, this was probably you know, 15 years ago or so. But they were camping um, not far from in the Squally River, <clears throat> and they found a, a line of footprints in the sand over there. Some really good ones, apparently. And he says, you know, this was the kind of kid that if she said something, you know, it was very believable, very credible. So, uh, and that was also the same place where we used to camp, where. Um, we were sitting around a fire again one night up there and we heard, heard the noises and my brother-in-law's heard things with me up there because we used to hike up, uh, on the uh, Glacier View wilderness that borders Mount Rainier on that side, just outside of Ashford pretty often. And, uh, we've heard things up there, screams off in the distance. So now, you know, he's like, oh, you know, and, and also, you know, <laughs> my poor brother-in-law, I drag him 700 miles away when I was still living in Puyallup down to the Bluff Creek area because we were going to go look for footprints. And we sit around one evening after we were out in the field for 14 hours or so. And he says, well, you know, just to be clear, I, I, what, do, what do footprints look like? What are we looking for? So I described what a typical Sasquatch track looks like. And he says, I think I saw some of those. I said, where? He says, out on, out on the Carbon River where I ride my bike. <laughs> and sure enough, we when we drove back a few days later, I had him take me out there, and it's a place, there's a, they took the railroad tracks out of a lot of those areas that log trains used to run, and they made these really nice black-topped bike, bike riding and walking trails, beautiful places, and right next to him, he had seen a father and a couple of kids playing in some water off the trail, and he saw these footprints in the mud, and he said, oh, I just, I just assumed that was the man's footprints. Well, they were 14-inch tracks, the same size as the Patterson tracks. So I, when we went there and looked, sure enough, there were Sasquatch tracks, and uh, I took a bunch of pictures, counted over 100 prints there. But, 
you know, you, you just never know. And it's funny coming from family members like that. And it's it doesn't lock it into place because he was one of those guys really skeptical, super skeptical until he started hearing these screams and then saw those footprints. Well, you know, and I hate to say it, but I don't think this is a one off um, for this recording that you sent. You know, they saw it. They saw something weird in the trees and they got these recordings. I can't help but wondering, and I mentioned this to you a little bit before we got on the air. I wonder about the people, the previous owners of the house, that they weren't motivated sellers. <laughs> <laughs> we got some property cheap. Well, you know, it was my nephew's first home purchase. So I, I don't know. You know, I mean, he now and again, I was mentioning or going to mention that he's a pretty credible guy. My nephew, uh, he's a combat veteran from <laughs> Afghanistan. So. Uh, you know, when he, when he says and does things, it's what he means. It's, there's no joking around, you know, he's, he's, a, you know, like the rest of the family jokes, of course, but stuff like that, you know, if he says something and he's serious, he's serious. And I have to wonder what the neighboring well, farms, if they're hearing stuff too. Well, that, that, uh, uh, you know, the, we just listened to that audio and I, what did I tell you? It sounds like some kind of, it sounds like something from a horror movie. Yeah, um, it does. And I, I don't know, did Tom, did you tell him about, uh, tell Will about what, uh, and I don't even think I told Chuck. I don't remember if I did say anything. Uh, I had just, just happenstance, it was kind of in passing that I said that, um, and Jessica and I actually went back out there and I drove over the wood. So, um, and then it suddenly dawned on me after I parked the car, I went, oh, wait a minute, that was, we had a limb fall off the oak tree out here, and I really need to back up and take a picture of this oak tree. It's huge. Adam knows what it looks like. It's huge. We sat out there underneath it, and uh, it was, it's, you know, they really enjoyed it because the breeze was blowing. The wind always blows. It's kind of like Oklahoma. The wind always blows in Texas, so you always have a breeze going on, <clears throat> even if it's 120 outside. But um, anyway, um, I, I drove over this limb, and I, after I got out, I, I looked at that, and I even asked Jessica, I said, did you see that limb? Because she always uh, comes out when when she gets off earlier than I do. She comes out and uh, lets the dog out so that she knows that I'm safe parking and all that sort of stuff. So, And uh, I asked her, I said, did you see this limb in the, the driveway here? And she said, no. And she couldn't remember it being there. She had... She right now, because we're down to one vehicle, uh, she walked down the driveway because she got a ride from somebody else. She'd actually walked down the driveway. And, I mean, this is like t- probably 25, 30 feet up in the air. This tree is big. It's huge. And uh, it's an oak tree. And this limb was just broken off, perfectly healthy limb because we actually got out there during the day and looked at the wood inside to make sure it wasn't a dead limb and it was perfectly healthy limb and it was probably about five feet long and there was leaves coming off of it you know green leaves and it was just broken and it it looked it appeared like something had gone too far out on the end of the limb and it broke with it and i know you're going to ask me if i look for tracks we actually did we didn't see anything but if it had been a cat or a possum or a raccoon, I think falling that distance, it would have hurt them. And uh, my raccoons seem to be just fine, and my, I don't have any injured cats. So, um, I, I, you know, and I hadn't really even seen any possums uh, here lately. So, you know what? I wondered about that, Tom, and I kind of discussed that a little bit. And, and I don't remember. Chuck, did I not tell you about that? I don't think he did. I don't remember. No, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, because yeah, Tom asked me, did you take pictures? And I'm like, uh, no. Uh, this was like 1 o'clock in the morning when I got off work. So it wasn't, again, that wasn't the first thing that came to mind. But, you know, because it wasn't until the next day that I kind of started wondering. Uh, you know, we just kind of pondered on, how did that limb fall down? Because we hadn't had any inclement weather or uh you know, heavy winds, nothing more than just normal winds blowing, you know. So well, Here's a question for us. What kind of tree was it? It's an oak tree. That's what I thought. And yeah. what was the diameter of the limb where it broke, you know, at the base? Well, 
it's probably a good inch and a half across. And uh, if you go around, the circumference is more like about probably three inches, you know, because I actually put was able to take and uh, almost reach my uh, thumb and index finger around it, have them reach together. So I would yeah. say it's probably about, uh, uh, but it's it's a good inch and a half across. And, That's a lot. Uh, and it was a good size. It was a good size limb, and you know, granted, something uh, I can't see that a cat that hit even if they'd gone well. First off, a cat or a raccoon, unless something was chasing them, wouldn't have gone that far out on a limb. And it almost looked like something had. Well, that's what I thought was that something was on it, and it fell. You know, just broke and fell with it. So, and and like I say, I don't have any uh, injured cats. And if they'd felt fallen from that distance, it would have hurt them. It would have hurt them. I mean, cats are pretty resilient, but still, you know, that, that's a that's a pretty good sizable fool. Well, it is. And, and oak, oak. I mean, we got a pretty good size oak tree in our backyard. The limbs don't fall. The acorns no, do, they, the leaves do, yeah. the limbs don't. Yeah, yeah. And it, it just, it was just kind of... It, you know, and I'm like looking up in the tree. I, I did stop when I, I saw the, the lamb and I kind of went, oh, I just drove right over that like a dummy. And um, I probably shouldn't have, uh, but uh, for the undercarriage of my car. But uh, I looked up and I was just kind of like, and we really looked up the next day when we went out there, both Jessica and I both did. And it was like, that is that's we could tell where it had broken off up there so it i'm telling you it was a good 30 feet 25 30 feet up there so you know that's that's kind of the norm as far as the size of the limb like that because we've we've found a lot of limbs like that out in the woods that you, you see that and you think okay that's that's kind of odd and it may just be you know, there may be a bunch of trees around there, but you only find like one or two. And uh, that it, it seems to be the norm for some reason. They'll break off a limb like that and and you come across it and you're thinking, okay, that's kind of odd. Yeah, I was, I was going to mention too, we talked briefly before we started here. Um, Tom, you remember, I don't know if you remember Gary we had on the show from Australia a year or two ago. <laughs> Interesting sure guy. Do. And he he had posted something on, uh, I think it's a new Facebook group that he's either runs or is part of. But it was a video. Uh, and this is from Australia. And you can see these very, very good footprints, Yowie tracks in this soil. And along the line of tracks, as the person's videoing, there's a pig that was torn in half. And I, I emailed him about it, and he responded and said that the uh, the pig had been torn in half farther back in the line of tracks, I think in the trees, and then carried to this spot and deposited. Because I was looking to see, well, you know, was there blood and things like that? But apparently that was previous in, in the line of tracks. So it carried the remains and dropped them, on, apparently on either side of the uh, footprints. I don't know if anybody out there has seen this video, but it's really interesting. And it's so reminiscent of what Joe and Walter found in East Texas, you know, the wild hog with its head torn off. And the story T.W. told us about that, the family that was doing yard work and their mastiff ran out to the tree line and was too late to get away. The creature grabbed it, tore it in half, and threw the halves at the family. Yeah, and it doesn't matter whether you're in Texas or North America or Australia. The behaviors is that repeating pattern that we're seeing over and over again worldwide. It was fascinating me to me because you know we it's one thing to hear like we talked about it's one thing to to hear people talk about something but then you actually see it in video. Well, and the thing is too that you know there may be differences in appearances. I mean we do we do hear about the differences of the Yowie down in Australia the Alma and uh, Russia, the Yeti and the Himalayas, that there's obvious uh, differences in the, uh, their, physic their physical differences in these uh, Bigfoot. Um, and, but their, the behavior seems to follow a certain pattern. And I think I go back to my um, 
deal with the chimpanzees. I mean, we do know that, you know, that there are differences in chimpanzees and from the bonobos, which are pygmy chimpanzees, to the, your standard pan troglodytes. And even those, when they live in different locales, they do take on a different, slightly different appearance. Now, and then you get your bondies or billy apes, you know, a.k.a. billy apes now, since they've changed the names of them. Um, and they definitely, uh, uh, they have a different appearance too but uh and they do have a slight difference in their behavior patterns they do be- behave in some ways a lot like uh, uh gorillas you know and nesting on the ground and such and we see that in bigfoot that they nest on the ground but they also nest in trees too you know that will because you've gotten uh you know pictures of that but what I, the point i'm trying to make is that there seems to be a uh uh you know general if we discard the the bonobos, that there seems to be a general uh, action among their behavior patterns that are are similar all the way across the board. And I think this is what we see in Bigfoot a lot, too. I just sent you both, or all three of you, I sent all three of you the the video that I was just talking about. It's, um, It's on something called Paranormal Connections. Oh, I think I've seen that. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. I think it's um, you know from what Gary says, it's uh, and Gary's a pretty uh, credible guy. So, and, you know, and you look at the footprints, look at the spacing between the footprints. It's so much like you know the Sasquatch tracks here. Well, I think some of the best thermal thermal imaging we've ever ever seen came out of Australia too. Yeah, they they do some good work over there. Well, those Aussies, they just, they're not afraid of anything. They just go right well, on Well, they out can't there. be. Every, everything wants to kill you there, so. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's kind of like Texas, you know? You're right. <laughs> if it's a snake, it's ready to get you. If it's a, well, and if it's a thorn. Sp- and spiders and plants and all. Else. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> oh, we don't even have spiders like that. They got, oh, my God. That's a pretty big track, too. It is. It's a good-sized one. But, yeah, he said that they, uh, apparently the pig had been torn apart farther back in in the tree line in the line of tracks and then was carried up to the spot where it was deposited. But now there's, it's obviously not for eating. Um, it's one of those behaviors. It's like, you know, it's just doing stuff like this for sheer wantonness. And, and that's something... You know, for uh, tomorrow's Bigfoot breakdown, we're going to be discussing the Bauman story that was in Teddy Roosevelt's book. And that behavior was kind of along the lines of this sort of behavior. And this isn't the first time, you know, we've heard of this kind of stuff. Uh Uh-oh, we lost Tom. Let me get Tom back. You know, that... that that track there looks a lot like the track that I sent you from that, that fencing man sent me from uh, South Texas. Yeah, it is very similar. It does. You know, I was just thinking about that. And it's also like Annabeth's tracks, too. I mean, they were, you know, when, mm-hmm. you, when, you, yeah. when you see good tracks, they're, they're pretty similar to each other. Let me see. Tom was having trouble with his internet. Uh-oh. Let me see if I can bring him back on. You know what? I don't like hogs, but I, that's that's no way to die. No, that certainly is not being torn in half. We're like the one, you know, Walter, and we're gonna have we're gonna have Joe and Walter on here pretty soon. I think I think we're recording them later this week. But they had some stuff that happened. But in reference to the hog that Walter found with its head removed and the head was nowhere in sight. Uh Oh, okay. Tom is having some issues. So let's see. He says, no telling when I'll be back on. Oh, Tom says he has no internet. They apparently, Uh they apparently were working on the internet in his area. So he was off earlier than he was on. 
Well, I guess we may have to wait to try to call him. Okay, he's going to let me know when he's back on. Well, okay, it's just the three of us. I didn't hear from David, so I don't know what's going on with him. Um, okay. <laughs> well, you know, this stuff, I mean, it's interesting how stuff comes in. Uh, you know, sometimes there'll be just quiet periods where there's nothing happening, and then all of a sudden there's a bunch of stuff. I talked to Fred in Alaska yesterday, too. He's got another area somebody contacted him apparently there's a bunch of crazy stuff going on so he's going to try to get back out there um uh oh did he mention what kind of crazy stuff was going on he didn't specify because i had to get off the phone we have we've got contractors in the house working yesterday and today so he didn't want to hold me up too long but he said he's going to get a hold of me he's going to try to get back out there to this guy's place he just got permission to go there and uh, I had to laugh too. He said they, uh, uh, the tribe that he's a member of, they bought some land, um, pretty pretty sizable chunk of it. And he says he told his dad, he says, you know, with our luck, it'll be the home of the hairy man, and we won't be able to go there. <laughs> and his dad told him, quit talking like that. It might be true. Well, anything new with you guys? I mean. No. I'm trying to think of something. I hadn't I hadn't heard anything here lately, which is kind of unusual. Usually by this time of the year, you, you start, they, they're out moving around. So. Yeah, especially this fall time of year, it's, it's kind of their big activity. That's, you know, that's interesting. I usually get stuff from, you know, areas up around where the salmon are running too, but I haven't heard much yet on that note. I was going to tell you guys too, um... We um, we did a recording with um, uh, Mr. Black recently, just a couple of days ago, and you, you guys are familiar, of course, with Chris in Tennessee. Chris is going to come back on. He was having some health problems a while back, had some heart issues, and was in the hospital a couple of times, and I don't know if they did a, a bypass on him or what, but um, <clears throat> so he's better now, but him and his wife saw something really weird, <clears throat> and uh, at, he asked... Actually, a friend of his, Paul, emailed me and asked me if I'd heard anything about this. And apparently this was non-Bigfoot related completely. Uh, so I contacted Mr. Black and I said, well, have you heard of anything like this? Well, apparently he had already spoken with Chris about this. And um, this is some kind of some kind of reptile. And it's pretty bizarre. So through we were Tom and I recorded him and um, where he discussed you know, what he knew about this stuff. So, and this has to do, folks, with the three-toed creatures, you know, the three-toed tracks we've talked about in the past. So, you know, I've been kind of running stuff by him, and he says, okay, let's let's go ahead and record some about this. So that's what we did. And in the course of our conversation afterwards, um, now, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm not really have much interest in stuff outside of this topic, and only because... I had my own personal experiences and long history with this stuff. Uh, so, you know, we, what we talked about was doing a completely different kind of a show. And, and Mr. Black said that um, his NDAs are now expired so he can actually talk about all this stuff. And, I, and he may even actually be taking the lead in, in uh, hosting this particular thing. So... You know, we're going to be recording. He wants to record uh, a bunch of segments before we actually release it. And it won't be on... It'll be on the YouTube page, but it'll be, it'll be a different channel. It'll be something separate on its own. And we can, you know, we can discuss things with him, but, um, you know, our panel is kind of disinterested. You know, we'll be more like, I guess, moderators or, or just interviewers instead of... You know, like with this topic, we all have kind of our own hand in this stuff our own experience right so i didn't want to really give too much of that away until um you know our friend adam he's going to make a whole different card for this and uh an introduction and all that kind of stuff so anyhow folks that's that's something that's going to be coming here i don't know when exactly um you know like i said we we have the first one recorded uh i guess i'm just waiting for adam to kind of get the intro done and and the artwork so now is this 
this reptilian track track is it is it kind of like the the same track that i sent you uh the one that was in the snow here in oklahoma city it could be i'd have to look at the pictures again that's interesting yeah it was this this three because everybody asked about this three toed stuff and and quite honestly you know i know what he's told me in confidential messages and on the phone uh, but I wasn't really ready to go too far. Now he says since his NDAs are expired, he's he can go out and talk about this stuff now, and we don't have to disguise his voice and do all that other stuff. And it cracks me up because we did the first Mr. Black thing where we had to. We couldn't. It was really hard to disguise his voice. And um, so I went through, and it's just such a pain. You know, you can. I, I paid for some software, Otter AI, which is pretty good. It gets about 95% of what's what's said in audio but you still have to go back word for word and make sure it's correct and there's a lot of things you have to change so it's really time consuming and i did the first hour but i think there's probably oh geez there's probably a couple more hours worth on that particular interview and i just haven't had the time with you know we're, we're getting houses ready to sell and move to new mexico and all this stuff so and when he when he told me that i'm like Whew, Boy, it'd be so much better not to have to do any of that stuff. You know, we just edit edit the the audio for gaps and things like that, and anything that he wants out of it. You know, but and he's also going to be able to bring other people on military and and whoever else that's relevant to whatever discussions that had involvement and stuff. So it might be interesting. I mean, it's uh, I guess it's sort of X filey kind of stuff, but. You know, it's uh, we're 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 hosting it, but we're sort of the dispassionate members. You know, the um, uninvolved interviewers. We, we... Well, I know it's it, yeah, I know it's deer season here, and uh, I actually talked to a couple of hunters that said they haven't even heard any gunshots here this, yet this year. Really, which is which is really really odd, and um. Because usually, when when the gunshots go off, you know a lot of the guys that actually get a deer, um, they the deer's gone. Oh, so, so I think it's just uh, just kind of odd that they haven't even heard any shots this year yet. You think maybe the hunters gave up knowing they weren't going to actually get a deer after they shot it? Uh, no, I don't think that's it because it, you know that's always been kind of a a tradition uh, for deer season. And when did, you, oh, Jack, when did your rifle season start up there? It started, uh, I think, yesterday the, or a couple of days ago. Huh, because see, ours, ours doesn't start here until November 1st. And uh, if they haven't changed it, it always ends on uh, January 1. But uh, our, our bow season is uh, going right now. But I, I can't, that was the other thing I was going to tell y'all is that uh, we came home uh, Saturday night and saw a big, I'd been wondering what, I'd seen this eight point buck alongside the, the road out here and, and the, the culvert when we saw our, um, you know, juvenile take off and this eight point buck was standing right in my driveway down by the house, right back right underneath the tree that we had the broken limb on. And the broken limb was the day before. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was going to mention, too, I remember our friend Don, who's a member of the Navajo Nation we had on a couple of times? He uh, he yeah. was texting me. He's um, They're up in an area now that's he said, has just regular Bigfoot activity all the time, but they're hunting up there. And uh, the first night he, he was texting me, he said they were hearing right after dark some some roars and some loud howls. And uh, he, you know, wasn't wasn't normal animals. Uh, but then the next night they were. I said, well, don't you know, don't get yourself a, become a sack lunch or anything. <laughs> he chuckled, said no. Uh, but the next night they got a really nice buck that he sent me pictures of, and I think he's going to be up there a few more days. But I said, well, you know, keep me posted on what's going on. He says they uh, they see these creatures every time they go up in that particular area. You know, my cousin went up to uh, Wyoming, uh, I think it was last week, last weekend, and uh, he goes up there every year, and uh, 
I, I was talking to my mom about it and I said, you know what, you know, he's going to be up in Wyoming and, and I know there's Bigfoot there because I, I got a friend of mine that, that actually found a bunch of sign up there at this one particular spot. And I, I was laughing at my mom. I said, yeah, I hope he, I hope he, cause he, he thinks my stuff is just a joke. You know, he, he's not really a believer in that stuff. And I said, I sure hope he runs across a Bigfoot while he's up there. But uh, he ended up he, he got a, he got a great big elk, but uh, you know it's that time of year and um, they you know it's it's hunting season not just for the hunters but for them too. Yeah, uh, that's but they, they they know the seasons. You know, going back to John Green's books when they did his card file calculations, I think in 1967 or 68. And that's what he came to the conclusion of was that the majority of the activity and sightings were in the summer and fall. And uh, emphasis on the fall because, um, of course, you know, in the Northwest you get a lot of, that's when the salmon runs are going. So, um, And I've had people call me. Uh, there was an older couple up near the Canadian border, and, and I can't remember the name of the river offhand. There's, there's all kinds of water up there. But um, <clears throat> they said where they lived was a pretty small community, and that these things, when the salmon were running heavy, um, they didn't care if there was people there or not. They'd go right straight to the river, ignore whoever how, and however many people. Could have been, he, he, they said there could have been 100 people standing there. These things would have walked right past them, didn't care, head right for the water to feed. That, that's pretty interesting, too. It is. I mean, and, and, you know, you're right. I mean, this time of year is the it's the, when they're feeding heavy before winter, so... Which is kind of like yeah, that's like those. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's, it's kind of like those people down there at the uh, at the lake, uh, not the Lake of the Arbuckles. Um, oh, my mind just went blank. The thirty or forty people that saw three Bigfoot going walking along the shoreline uh, in the Wichita Mountains area there at the lake, and you know it, that that was just. Oh, a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, the fish could have been spawning right in there at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, what do you think, Forrest? I mean, I don't know. I well, I think that up in your area, I think you're going to see a more seasonal movement. And even though, uh, and even kind of down here, because, you know, I told you before that uh, we really had, um, like I really, they they started kind of moving out of here in the, um, or I, I, you know, in the the summer, this uh, late spring and early summer, you know, and I think they move more west where the lakes are, but um, and there's a more you know substantial water uh, source because the deer move that way too, and that's just like eight miles down the road, but I seem to be uh, having uh, a continual problem here now, but. Um, you know, and I don't hunt on my property, so the deer during the uh, deer season, and I was actually thinking about this last night, um, <laughs> I don't hunt on my property, and I don't even allow my relatives to hunt here, much to their chagrin, but that's just the way it is. I mean, I kind of think of the deer as my babies, and I think maybe that's why I have more activity here. Yeah, it could be. You know? <laughs> well, they don't have any <laughs> and, interference from human hunters. No, that's true. So, um, not like unless I got people sneaking on the property, which I wouldn't put that past anybody nowadays. Oh, but yeah. uh, you know, you know. But uh, um, I just, you know, we don't see as much seasonal movement, and I don't think uh, uh, Chuck does either up there because we just don't have the horse winters most of the time. Now we, uh, Chuck and I, have had. Back in 2020, we suffered through that sub-zero temperatures and stuff that is very highly unusual for this area. But, um, you know, we just don't have that seasonal, uh, you know, change like y'all do up there, you know, with snow. And, I mean, we get a little bit of snow, but it's nothing that it's going to tamper a Bigfoot. Yeah, you guys uh, are going to have different behavior patterns there. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think it's unusual to see them so much in the wintertime, but uh, – around here in the fall and i think it has a lot to do with the fact that i have a lot of deer out here and they're going to go um, where the food is 
Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't like them eating my deer, but, you know, I'd rather them eat the deer than my cats. <laughs> That's very so. true, very true. You know, or the dogs or <laughs> yourselves. Oh, me. He, you know, <laughs> so I, I would prefer, prefer to, to live a long life and, <laughs> and be, not become a, a you know, Sasquatch uh, snack. Yeah, you, so, don't, you, don't want to be, anyway. you don't want to be the proverbial sack lunch. No, I don't. No, I really don't. <laughs> Well, what about? I know, well, there. Go ahead, I know, I know, Forrest. I know Forrest and I both in in our areas. I mean, we the pig population here is just just exploded, and um, it's it's not that they don't have enough to eat because they, they are they are everywhere. Well, you know, I asked oh, yeah. I asked Mister Black about that. Where we were, I, I actually didn't. I didn't pose that question. We were chatting about something else. And and the subject of food came up, and he says, "Well, do you know why they're in Texas?" And I, I I could have given him all kinds of responses, but I wanted to hear what he had to say. So I said, "Well, no," and he says, "The wild hogs makes a lot of sense. It does, it really does." You know, I have to go back. You guys remember? You remember the the show we watched as kids? You know, the Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, the little animated thing that they made. And you remember the part, and I always wonder how they come up with this, where they talked about the, the, the Bumble, the abominable snowman, and he wouldn't pass up a good pork dinner. How did they come Why did they, why did they, and they're up in the mountains where there's snow, why would they say pork? Why not deer? Wow, that's interesting. Uh, like your Yetis don't have, uh, I don't think they have pigs up in the mountains no. with the Yetis. no. Where did they come up with that? I always always wondered that. Huh. I beat the heck out of me. <laughs> you remember when Cornelius was going to go get the bumble and he started making the pig noises? He's, he said, he says, the bumbles can't resist a pork dinner. And I'm thinking, well, how would they know that? And then Mr. I never even I, n I never even realized that. Yeah, it's just it's it's always in these little details that things come out. But then Mr. Black said that about you know in the in the Southwest, and I thought, well, now is there some kind of connection we don't know about going on here? I mean, well, I think you know what I think Bigfoot are just like uh, people; they're opportunistic. Uh, I mean, they like to move. You know, they're pretty much seen everywhere. They I are. mean, and uh, so, I mean, even we have South American, uh, you know, references to them and other animals that resemble resemble them. And, you know, primates are everywhere. You know, they're just like humans. We're everywhere. We're everywhere. And um, except Antarctica. I don't think we found any human remains in Antarctica, but you know that remains to be seen. Right. But um, anyway, uh, they're probably a lot now. But <laughs> you know, due, <laughs> due to the fact that we have uh, people, you know, doing research down there. But anyway, um, if they're going to go, and they're going to adapt to whatever people are adaptable. Primates are adaptable, and they're going to go where there's food and where there's an opportunity to eat. And, uh, you know, if it's easier to catch stuff down here in Oklahoma and Texas and the South, uh, because we have a, a large, uh, you know, whitetail deer population and, you know, we've had, and they brought in these Atlas deer. So we see a lot of, uh, deer. In fact, I was on the phone with Chuck. Remember that, that one night at <laughs> Chuck, I was like, Oh my God, Oh my God, Oh my God. And I had to slam on the brakes and we had this doe that ran across. Literally, I missed her by inches. I would have probably told the car because this, this doe, and I am not lying, she was big as an elk. I was just like, oh, my God. And the first thing that crossed Jessica's in my mind was that uh, I think she was probably an atlas cross. Uh, and so uh, I, we would get these piebald and skewbald colored uh, deer out here. And it's all because, you know, the atlas deers are spotted. And then they cross with the white tail. And then we get all these, you know, we even get snow white deer. And uh, it's, you know, um, it's just bizarre. But, I mean, they're going to go where there's food, and there's plenty of it down here. Yeah, that's true. 
uh, you know, lots of it, especially with the, you know, the wild hogs being as prolific as they are. Oh, yeah. And I, they can eat all the hogs they want. I won't argue <laughs> with them on there. Yeah. You know, the bad part, it makes a big population of Bigfoot, though. Well, you know, sometimes you have to take the good with the bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as they aren't making any human sack lunches, that's fine. They can have all the pork they yeah, want. Yeah, this is true. No cat. It, it, the, the hogs keep them from eating people and, and uh, cats and dogs and, and uh, you know, that's fine. They can, I'm happy they can have all that. the bacon they like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll even cook them up for them. If they, you know, it makes me them. wonder, too, like in, you know, in the southeast where they're having all the snake problems, you know, the boas and all that, um, if they aren't eating a lot of that stuff, too, those snakes. Well, you, evidently they're not eating enough if they are. So, I mean, uh, if somebody didn't get a, gra- a grasp on that real quick, you know, people that have turned those things loose. They ought to they ought to be took out and horse whipped because I mean they have absolutely destroyed the uh, mammals in that area and I mean everything and they're even working on the alligators I mean they go after the small alligators and American crocodiles down there and uh, they're decimating these populations I mean um, it's, it's shameful that people. I think they should outlaw the ownership of those kind of snakes and just stop it. It's stupid. So, it really is. Mm-hmm. You know, but, but there, yeah. there are some dumb people that do dumb things out there, unfortunately. Well, yes. Uh, we <laughs> The whole world has had a history of that for thousands and millions of years, obviously. So, But, you know, the bad um, part is but, it's detrimental to the environment and people when they're doing things like that with no thought about any repercussions. Well, I mean, and you see some of the snakes that they're pulling out of there now, 19, 20 feet long oh, snakes. And now I just saw where that there's, they're, they've come up with a hybrid uh, between these uh, rock pythons and the, the boas. Yeah, and, and apparently they're they aggressive. Be, it, yes, and they're evidently far more hardy than the other snakes. Right. So, I mean, what in the world What in the world is this monster we've created? And, and those things are going to start moving. And the next thing you know, they're gonna they're eating pets. They, I mean, they oh, have yeah. they have no, and it's 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 recorded. I mean, they had some uh, lady that called, and they had a, a, a fifteen or sixteen footer that was called up in their next to their pool, and they couldn't find their cat. Well, the Uh-oh. the they found their cat. Their cat was in the the snake had killed and eaten their cat. Oh no! And I mean, uh, you know, and I see comments by these. You know, people that like reptiles, oh, they think that's funny. Well, it's just the food source. Well, you know what? It's not funny. You know, they consider them pets. We consider our cats and dogs and rabbits and all that sort of stuff pets, too. And, you know, I shouldn't have to worry about whether or not my animal's going to. It's bad enough i got to worry about them being eaten by coyotes or Bigfoot or whatever. You know, and now we're, we're putting them up. I mean, they get put up every night, oh, locked yeah. up. You know, I shouldn't have to, but what happens during the day, you know? We, i got to worry about right? snakes, too, now. Well, you know, you watch the show. I, I like watching the show. Swamp people are pretty interesting. And then they have the spinoff they did with the snakes. Yeah, personally, I mean, these guys are out there grabbing snakes and putting them in a bag. I'd be out there with a shotgun. It's like, the hell with grabbing that thing. I'm blowing its head off when I see one. Well, uh, yes, but you, you've got these idiots that say, oh, we have to kill them humanely. You know, I'm sorry. Screw that. The, the humane, humane thing is blow their head off, and then then you can take what's left and make boots out of it. Right. You know that's the way I look at it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. You know, I'm not touching one. <laughs> where is, where's the humanity in finding your cat in the in the belly of one of well, these and, things? And, or you know, when's the next time it's going to take a person or a child? Well, and there was one of those shows. They they went out and found. I think they called it a green um, anaconda? anaconda. That thing was huge. Yeah. Oh my god. Yes, anacondas now they're finding down. Who in the world wants a freaking anaconda? And you see in, in like, you see in Indonesia those things are actually eating people there when they get a chance to. Well, the, not the anacondas because they don't have them in Indonesia. No, but they're the, only in South America. What, what do they have? The, is it the pythons? pythons? They have the pythons or the boas? Yeah, the py- oh yeah. There was we. They, they had a. They, I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, <laughs> I no, get wound up about this uh, because uh, I, I don't know if I ever told you guys that I actually. I had rented the house here when we were stationed uh, in Alaska, and I came in, and I did not know. The guys did not tell me. They had a freaking 15-foot boa, boa constrictor oh, no. in my house. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
And I was like, what the H? Uh, no, that thing has got to go. And I found out later they were going to adopt it out. Well, BS. Oh, you know Lord. what they did? They took it, took it out to the lake eight miles from here and let it go. How stupid is that? Well, I, I reported them, but it, 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 you know what? It, how how you, how's the game warden going to go out there and hunt for one boa constrictor? You know, I, you know, I'm actually surprised they haven't spread into Texas yet. I suppose they're heading in that direction. Well, I told you that that one uh, when the night that the gentleman that came out and looked at the uh, when we had the uh, camera out here that we found game camera, mm-hmm. he, the sheriff that came out here, he had just been driving down one of the county roads here south of here and there was a, a one that had gone across the road he really? said he knew it was and i was like and you didn't run over the dang oh thing my God. <laughs> and and then he made some silly statement like i thought they were native here i'm a native no no <laughs> <laughs> not native <laughs> well, that... they may have become native because you've got these nitwits that are turning uh, them loose geez. but uh, you know uh, it just kills, you know, they're detrimental to all the small uh, wildlife and even to deer. When they get big enough, they can actually take down deer. That's what they're talking about when you see the show, uh, not Swamp People, but the spinoff where they do the snakes. And apparently they've decimated the wildlife populations in some of those areas completely. So the snakes are actually moving north now. North, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're following the food. Mm-hmm. I'm, just, I'm just wondering if the Bigfoot is not... If you know, how come we haven't seen stories or heard stories of of seeing a Bigfoot, you know, with a snake wrapped around him? Uh, that's what I'm wondering. Well, they're not going to hurt a big, the- they're not going to hurt a Bigfoot. That's for sure. Right, but yeah, but I, now you I've, say that you say that, uh, and those things. I don't care how big a Bigfoot is, unless they get them right. Those things get wrapped around. I think a Bigfoot might even. Depending on the size of a Bigfoot, they might have difficulty, uh, Will. Well, I don't know. Now, remember the strength of the Sasquatch. Remember I talked last week, we were talking about the video I saw about the chimps who had caught another chimp, a different group, and they killed it, and they were eating it, and yeah. how easily they were tearing it apart. I mean, like it was just nothing. I, I think, you know, and we see, you know, we talked about the video. I'm going to see if Gary's going to let me. I'll, uh, I'll see if I'm about posting that um short video that gary had uh on on the jrg bigfoot research page on facebook so people can see that and i'll reference gary's site but um if they can tear a pig apart like it's nothing tear a dog apart like it's nothing uh randy up in canada tore a moose apart i think they have no problem with a snake well i would hope so but you know a moose or a pig or even deer are not going to, or even a dog is not going to respond the same way that, uh, you know, I have even seen tigers that have taken on some of these big boas that have difficulty mm. finally taking them down and only because they have bitten them so many times that the snake finally gives it up. Here's the thing you to know? remember too, though, uh, with the Sasquatch being, you know, a primate, you know, they're a group, well, they're, it's got hands. they're a group animal. Yeah. So they're not going to be alone. Yeah. If one of them were getting in trouble, they have the other members of the group helping. Well, yeah, but have you ever seen a cacks with uh, when they get attacked by boa constrictors? The whole group will come in and gang up on them, but they don't. They're all like away, and they'll go up and kind of grab the the tail and stuff like that. But and once one of them has been taken hold of by uh, by the snake, they're all kind of like just they'll just they all look at each other like, what do we do? What do we do? Because they don't want to really get in there and and start. Uh, fighting with it because they they know what those things I don't, those snakes I don't, can do. I don't think you'd have that problem with a Bigfoot, though. Well, I would hope I, not. I think, the others, no. I think the others would come right in there and they'd look at it probably as a meal opportunity. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And when you, well, I think maybe we, maybe we should import some of them down. Yeah, start sending your Bigfoot down to South Florida. <laughs> tell them, <laughs> there, the, weather's, there should tell be, them the weather's better and the food source is great. <laughs> there, should be, there should be plenty of them in that area. It, it'd be interesting to hear if anybody's had any stories of seeing them eating snakes or, you know, catching them or whatever. Right. Well, I mean, I that's, that's what I'm wondering is, is how come somebody hasn't found something like that already. I mean, we find the, we find the deer and we find the, oh, yeah. the wild hogs and, and stuff like that, but I... I haven't heard anybody say anything about, you know, a boa constrictor or anything like that wrapped around a, 
Bigfoot or a Bigfoot carrying one away. I, I, I've I, never heard that before. You know, I think the telltale thing would be to see one, you know, if somebody was out there doing whatever and they happen to see a dead snake hanging up in a tree somewhere. That would be pretty indicative of, of that kind of behavior because they do it with other yeah, animals. We haven't, heard, we haven't heard of anything like that. Right. No, so if anybody out there has seen it or heard of anything like that, let us know. That'd be well, very interesting they, to come across they, something like that. They said that they've had a slight change in the behavior of bobcats, that they now see bobcats uh, eating the the, ne- the eggs out of the nest. Oh. And uh, I guess, yeah, bobcats have never messed with uh, alligator eggs or anything like that, but they're now, they're eating, they're finding that bobcats are eating the uh, snake eggs. But, you know, uh, these boas, they guard their nests, so that might not be such, work out to be such a good thing for the, the bobcats because they're eating the bobcats, too. Well, you know why they're pro- why the bobcats are probably doing that is because all their other food sources aren't there. You know, the snakes, well, yeah. the snakes have eaten the other food sources, so what have they got left if they're still in the area? Yeah, I, I understand that, but, you know, if, if they can continue doing that successfully, that would be a help. But, it would, yeah. You know, the thing... Oh my God! I, the snakes just—I don't—I don't have a problem. I don't bother my snakes that I've got around here because I figure everything's got a place. But you know, uh, boa constrictors and pythons and anacondas—that's an entirely different kind of it is reptile. And you see, they've also got and, big lizards and things that people have taken as pets and let go there too that are invasive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they will—they will—they're carnivorous too. They will oh, take yeah. on uh, any small birds and and uh, probably kittens and and uh, rabbits and such as that you know people have it's like humans just don't show any good sense you wouldn't see a primate taking something out of its uh, natural no. uh, you know area and moving it someplace else oh let's let's you know let's do this no no it seems that sometimes the lower order of primates uh, and your apes have better sense and show better sense than even humans do. Except they do eat monkeys and other chimps. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so do humans. Well, true, but it's more of an aberrant behavior among humans than it is what the chimps are doing. Although, we don't know what our, our ancestors were like. Well, no, that's true, too. Well, guys, we're just about out of time. Uh, Tom didn't make it back. He's having trouble with his internet. So having said that, thanks for joining us around the fire folks and, uh, visit us next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.